Hello, uh, my name is Lip and I'm from Coxshire and Ipswich Museum Service. Thank you very much for having us. Um, I'm joined today by Ellie, my colleague Ellie Root, um, and we are going to be chatting a bit about the Museum from Home activity packs that we uh, were involved in over the summer. Ellie was the complete brains and driving force behind that, so I'm going to hand over to her to tell you a bit about it before we then have a bit of a chat later on. Hi everyone, so I am going to just share my screen so oh, you can see the lovely photos that I can see. Oh, hang on. Uh, There's Ellie. <laughs> oh, slideshow from beginning. There we go. So there I am. Look at me, all hopeful and clear eyed because I'm not uh, knackered yet. <laughs> my shirt isn't full of stuff. So hi everyone, I'm um, Ellie and I am one of the collections and learning curators for Colchester and Ipswich Museums, but based for an Ipswich Museum. So we do some stuff across town, but this project was Ipswich Museum. Um, and that's how you can get hold of me if you would like to. Uh, so we're gonna be talking, as Lyd said, about how we turned my house into an activity pack production centre. Um, a little bit about uh, the logistics to get started before me and Lib pull the project apart a little bit. So, what did we do? So early on into lockdown, I was really concerned about the lack of opportunities for people with limited internet access. So that might be families who don't have Wi-Fi, who might have a phone, but only one between them, uh, or, or just no access at all. For people really struggling, and there were people really struggling um, during lockdown and, and now. Um, if you are having to choose between paying your gas and electric and buying food, internet and craft materials and that kind of stuff just doesn't get a look in, you just can't think about it. Um, and I saw some really brilliant content being produced, um, but it all required people to be able to stream videos and uh, or print something off. I don't know anyone that owns a printer anymore, so um, it seemed like we were missing something. So I had a chat with one of our marvellous partners, um, Philip, who works at the Job Centre about the families he supports, and he he was really blunt. He said that families in Ipswich were in crisis. They had reached a crisis point a week or so into lockdown. Um, and uh, parents were at their limit with their patients, uh, trying to find ways to homeschool their children. Many people were key workers, so had to keep going to work in factories, in frontline services. Um, and there was a lot of fear, fear about lack of opportunity, fear about what would happen. Um, and at the same time, I was on Twitter and I saw that one of our incredible partner organisations, Volunteering Matters, were trying to group together emergency supplies and find ways to distribute this to the community um, as quickly as they could, because there was just no time. So I DM'd Stephen at Volunteering Matters um, and said, if I show up at Volunteering Matters with a big pile of stuff, vaguely sorted into bags, can they go in your emergency supply packs so that we can just give nice things out to it. Uh, and these, this is a photo, I think by the looks of it, this is our under five pack that we made. <laughs> so the first packs were done on a complete shoestring. Our management team said that I could go and strip the education stores and I literally, I just loaded it all into the back of my car, basically. Uh, and the first wave of packs uh, were 230, all with leftovers. So we didn't have volunteers at this point. It was me and my colleague Mel, um, and uh, Stuart and Will as well from our visitor services team, just bundling stuff, whatever we could find in bags. Um, and because we knew internet access might be a problem and, you know, if people are struggling, they're not going to think of a hundred incredible craft ideas with lolly sticks and bits of wool. Um, I put together like a, Pinterest, a printed off version of Pinterest, I guess, with ideas of what you could do with your lucky dip bag. Um, and they, it was so makeshift. They were printed on bits of paper that I chopped up, you know, it was just whatever I could find. I'm fairly certain I gave out dried up glitter glue and the panic to get things out. But this project relies on us moving really, really fast to meet an immediate need, not planning for something six months in advance, uh, which is unusual for museums, we like planning for things six months in advance. So the next thing that happened is money appeared. Um, and I do mean appeared. I got a phone call one day from a funder asking if I could spend three grand on activity packs in two weeks. And I sort of panicked because that has never happened to me before. Uh, so I shouted yes, um, without really thinking about how it would work. Um, uh, and with this kind of was a theme of this project, that money just kind of appeared as we needed it. Uh, so 
the, the um, Arts Council were incredible, the Norfolk and Norwich Festival Bridge were amazing, and our management team committed about £3,000 to help me pull these together. Um, and also I should mention the Association for Suffolk Museums as well, who chipped in about £3,500. Um, and that let us scale up our operations slightly uh, and uh, recruit some freelancers to help out as well, who was in the background, that's the incredible Claire Fryver. Um, and some of my friends, once we were able to have people in our gardens again, who my friends who have been furloughed, um, volunteered their time. And that was amazing. So we started production lines in my garden. Um, and in the end, we made 2,249 activity packs. My heart that it's not 2,250. Uh, you can see the kind of setup I had. It was my garden chairs piled up with boxes and people would walk down the boxes and fill up a bag and once they got to the end the pack was done. So um, we can have a look at some of the packs. I think this is a second wave pack because it looks quite fancy so I'd got money by this point. Um, and you can see some of the uh, partners that had started joining us. Um, and this was sort of fluke. I got sent to a meeting of Arts Council funded organisations in Ipswich because one of our managers couldn't go and we just kind of did an update and I said, look, I think I'm going to try and make more activity packs. Can anyone give me anything they have? And they were incredible. So for CT Company, you can see their little Eden packs which are about growing with these gorgeous press seed packs. Suffolk libraries just stripped their supply cupboards and gave them to me, hundreds of books, it was amazing. Um, Red Rose Chain made me activity sheets, and um, the New Wolsey Theatre chipped in, Suffolk Records Office, Dance East. There was this really wonderful moment quite early on where I had run out of paper, so I phoned someone at Dance East, I emailed someone at Dance East, who phoned their caretaker, who left me packs of paper in a doorway, because that was the only way I could get paper in the beginning of of the lockdown uh, and let's have a look at another one so this is our um send activity pack that we sent out um and you can't see this one very clearly but the idea was that uh through photos and suggestions you could go on a sensory tour of our victorian natural history gallery so there's a peacock feather to stroke um, a wind up butterfly some fur that resembles the bear fur a spiky ball that is our porcupine fish and some castanets uh, for deer hooves, um, and then a book about some of the animals you might see. And we also, so we did a couple of different iterations of the packs. So we did mostly seven to 11 year old kind of crafts, arts, dance and movement packs. Um, but we did also do the under five activity packs and the packs for children with special education. So once we had the packs, and this is a kind of a, a bit of a circular process, we had to work out, once we had the money for the packs, I should say, we had to work out how on earth we were going to distribute the packs. It couldn't just be me in my car, that would never work. Um, so I started putting the feelers out and having chats with our partners. Um, so this photo is volunteering matters. Uh, and in the background, I think I can see Sarah and Tonya, who were incredible. Um, uh, so we work with volunteering matters, as I said, but we sort of reached new people. So I'm going to read the list because I can never remember everyone. So we worked with Volunteering Matters, as I said, who distributed to families in receipt of free school meals or involvement in social care in some fashion. Uh, food banks, Suffolk Youth Mental Health Project, Lighthouse Women's Refuge, Anglo-Chinese Cultural Exchange, Suffolk Primary Association for Head Teachers, who then sent out to various schools, BSC Multicultural Support, the YMCA and the YMCA Parent and Child Unit, Suffolk Parent and Carer Network, the Local Virtual Schools List, the Benjamin Foundation, Children's and Young People Services at Suffolk County Council, and Suffolk Family Carers, as well as some schools that got in touch with me directly and said, we have children who are desperate, what can you do and how quickly can you do it? Um, and as I've said already, this, there was kind of a lot of network building. So these were the people who were helping us distribute, but we also had this incredible kind of cohort of arts organisations and funders who were helping us as well. <laughs> so I want you just to, and I know we'll, we'll, we'll think about um, where things didn't go quite so well uh, when we have a chat, but I did want to include a slide about the things that went wrong. This is my friend Ro, uh, who volunteered making some beautiful pencils. Liv, I think you did these pencils too. I think this is one of your masterpieces. Yeah. <laughs> so by the end of August, 
we pretty much delivered all the activity packs and the initial need had begun to die down as children returned to school and, and kind of things started moving again. Um, and I was able to reflect a little bit more. Um, and I had a few other less safe for work uh, uh, titles for this life. I, I think, um, yeah, the gist is I didn't get part of the strike. So the, my, my real regret is that in my initial to rush to get stuff out, sometimes the quality in the packs was not great. Um, kids probably didn't get the gift that I, I want, you know, I wanted it to feel like a present had arrived. Um, and I really struggled to find a balance between quality so that it felt like they were getting something really good and worthwhile and valuable and quantity. So, for example, when I spoke to the Suffolk Parent and Carer Network who support families in Suffolk who have um, children with special educational needs, I said, I'm making activity packs. What would be useful? How many would you like? He said, great, two, three thousand. And I went, oh, I was thinking like a hundred. Um, and in the end, I, I was able to do 165. But finding that balance, I found really, really hard. Um, and the only uh, way I could find around it was that we would introduce like a base level of quality so that each kid could have um, colouring pencils, something sticky, glue or sellotape, colouring paper, activity booklets and a few other bits and pieces. And then I was still topping bags up with just whatever I could find. Our Ed stores are actually really tidy now because they're Ed. <laughs> uh, and I guess this is what we're going to talk about, Lib. That is me uh, outside my house with 615 packs that went to the virtual schools list. And if you look carefully, I look very tired in this photo. Um, so I guess in terms of what next, ideas are welcome. We've developed some really brilliant relationships and we need to think about that. Um, but I guess for me, the key legacy of this project is that Ipswich Museums was able to demonstrate our intentions to our community. I really hope we put our money where our mouth is when we say we want to be of service to our community. We were able to be generous with our time and our resources. And it felt amazing to email people and say, hey, this is what we're doing. How are you? How are your clients? How are the people you support? Would this help them? And what would it need to look like? to be of service in some way. Um, and there were moments where I was really overwhelmed by the kindness that people showed me um, and the good wishes and goodwill that I felt. Um, and I guess it was really a timely reminder that for museums and I guess lots of other organisations, without our community, we really are just a building with a pile of stuff inside. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna leave it there because I think we're gonna talk a bit more. Cool. Stop sharing. Thank you. Stop share. There we go. Lovely. Well, I mean, I'm going to, I mean, I know some of the answers to this, but uh, in the interests of um, uh, helping other people learn a bit more about um, what we did, I'm going to pose some questions to you and make it sound like I don't. So, <laughs> hearing everything that's happened, and thank you very much for that very good cool run through, it sounds like the whole process was quite kind of organic. And usually in our world, the word reactive is kind of a bad one that we want to be kind of proactive and know what's coming before we get there. But it feels like that's kind of how it had to be. So, I mean, how, how did you cope with <laughs> like going through all of those kind of react, those emails, those conversations and getting stuff out as soon as you could? Yeah, I guess I kind of touched on it a little bit that this just is not how we have ever worked before. If you, I think, had asked me at the beginning of April to create a project where we distribute 2,200 and whatever packs um, to vulnerable families in Ipswich, I would have panicked. Um, and I had moments of panic anyway. Um, and I would have written a plan and then I would have gone out to our partners and asked them to write me letters and then we would have gone to funders and it would have taken forever and there just was no time. And I think this project was such a sharp lesson in how quickly we can move when we want to. And I also think there is something in there about the red tape that disappeared. So to some degree, the reason that my brain would have gone, we will write a project plan and then we'll look at funders and we'll get letters of support is because that's what's asked of us. But I had funders just outright tell me they wanted to give me money with no requirements. There was no, 
ask in terms of evaluation. There was no, I just had to kind of tell them what I'd spend the money on. And they were like, and if you can send us photos, that would be great. But we know that that's really hard right now. Is that there was a lot of trust there then, you know, that they were kind of yeah. knew that you were doing some good work and yeah, that red tape kind of dissolved a little bit. Yeah, I hope so. I also think we had no choice. <laughs> Do you know, things were, we needed to move quickly and we had to meet our community where they were and our community and the organisations that we work with did not have time for museums bringing slow pondering organisations. Our community needed us to act fast. And it was incredible to be able to do that. I feel like we proved some of the things that we have been saying for the last few years about how we want to work in partnership and be of service and find reciprocity between, you know, what we're hoping to achieve and, and what our community and our community organisations are hoping to achieve. Yeah, cool. And I mean, in in your presentation sort of earlier on, you were talking about how you were able to kind of approach people really, really quickly. Now, I'm guessing that means we obviously had various kind of partners already on our kind of books that we've worked with in the past. Are you able to talk a little bit about kind of maybe kind of how we'd come to form those relationships, maybe why we'd come to form some of those? <laughs> well, I think there's a kind of two things that are happening. So there are partners, there are partnerships that we have that we have formed really intentionally. So, for example, we have a really good working relationship with the Job Centre. We work with them all the time. Um, in quite an involved way. Um, so that initial chat I had with Philip at the Job Centre, you know, that I, I know I can just phone him up and he knows me and we'll have a really honest chat about what the museum can do and how we could work together right now. And that's kind of quite a involved, ongoing relationship. And I think it's all right to balance that with relationships that you have for, that kind of pick up intensity and then happen more quietly and then pick up intensity. And I think that's the case with a relationship, for example, with the YMCA, is that we work with them in this really focused way. Helen at the YMCA knows she can email me and ask me for stuff. And I could email her and be like, hey, I've got these activity packs. What would the young people that you support really like to see in them? Like, what would look good right now? And, and I think we have moved away from this idea that the museum has an idea for what might get funding or what we might like to do or an anniversary we want to celebrate. So what what might be coming up but you know like a like we've we've got to do something about this so we'll go to our community and say if you want to be involved with us it's on these terms and we started just having conversations and finding out what they're doing and how that fits with what we're doing and maybe what we need to change so that what we're doing supports them better and I think this project I just don't think it could have happened without that good relationship um, and without people trusting us and knowing us and, you know, knowing my face and the faces of my colleagues and, you know, that I could DM Twitter, it, uh, I could DM Stephen at uh, Volunteering Matters. It's that kind of fluidity, I guess, and knowing what they're trying to achieve and responding to that. I feel like I, you know, we've taken a lot of credit for something that actually was volunteering matches idea, and we just we just joined in. <laughs> True. Um, it sounds like as well as volunteering matters, it sounds like there was also you name checked quite a few arts organisations. Now, obviously, sort of artsy organisations sometimes might seem a bit different to us in the museum world. Someone like Dance East, they might kind of, on the face of it, seem a little bit like what's the crossover there? But I imagine actually there was a lot of crossover. Can you kind of tell me how we kind of came to work with them? Yeah, well, um, it was a complete accident, I guess, in some ways. So we have um, the big arts organisations in Ipswich, the larger ones, um, uh, have a, a, a meeting, a network called uh, We Are Ipswich. Um, and that tends to be the people working at a strategic level so they can get together, have a chat, see where there's overlap. But actually, and I think this was really positive, there was a, a meeting of people at the like the doer level and so not the strategic people setting the overarching plans but the kind of people who know what's in the back of the bedroom cupboard uh, <laughs> and know what they have time to do yeah. so you know like you know eastern angles knew they had time to put together some sheets for me that i could print out yeah. Uh, yeah. and the um, melissa at the libraries was like do you know what i've got loads of books we can just give them to you 
So there was something, I, th I think there's something in there about having networks uh, of, of organizations like that, not just strategic, but also at the, what my friend would call the bloody doers. So, you know, it's the people that are just going to get stuff done. And I, I think um, that was really wonderful. And I think perhaps part of the legacy of this project is how that kind of loosely connected group of bloody doers stays supporting each other and stays saying, oh, cool, well, you're doing a play about this. And I don't know, we have these objects in our collections. Or I had a chat with this community organisation the other day and they were saying something really similar. Shall I connect you to you? It doesn't, and I guess that's also a shift away from our work being all about us and about the museum and our work being about connecting people in and around us and being a part of this kind of fragile cobweb, mm -hmm. I guess, rather than a formal, a formal network. And it kind of, uh, sort of links back to what you said earlier on about the sort of things happening quickly. You know, we have to have and we need to have people at that strategic level, but it, that's where sometimes things need to be kind of thought about and processed a bit more and in that moment and at that time those doers were the ones that were able to presumably as soon as they put the phone down or finished like receive the email get off, out their chair and go and get the stuff and be like yeah I've just counted we've got however many I can do this and yeah, it, was, yeah. it was happening instantly because of that yeah with the support of the people at the strategic level <laughs> most of the time and <laughs> um, it sounds like it also led to a lot of new relationships and sort of new people getting on board that potentially we hadn't kind of worked with sort of before. Um, I was wondering whether or not you could speak a bit more about those and sort of, I mean, did the new relationships that as they were forming, potentially they were unexpected lead to kind of things going off in different directions or I mean, how did it, how did it yeah. affect the project? Well, I think this is something I really want to think more about in terms of the legacy. So we, have never, for example, worked with the Women's Refuge before. We, we did an event with them once a while ago, and that was great. Um, but I, we do need to think about how we can further support them. So it needs more conversation and the Suffolk Parent and Care and Carer Network. We were able to support them quite specifically because they told us exactly what they wanted. Um, and I, I, I don't know if there's something in there about what, what I kind of touched on about there being levels of engagement that pick up and drop off with your community partners. So, but that's not, that's something different to that old fashioned project model of community engagement, where you pick your community up, you do the project that you wanted to do, and then you ditch them as soon as they don't fit with your, your current set of goals and they're not gonna rubber really stamp your group. Yeah, they're not gonna rubber stamp your funding application, as opposed to an ongoing relationship where sometimes it's very involved. So you're doing really focused work and sometimes they're just using your spaces. So mm -hmm. sometimes you're just letting them use your education room for free because that's what they need right now. And if you can, you know, offer them your loans boxes, you know, I there's something in there about how we manage so many relationships and keep them really positive, but with finite resources. And I'm still, I'm still pulling that apart, I think. Ideas welcome, my Twitter, <laughs> and all was in the first slide. Please tell me if you know. <laughs> I mean, also sort of expanding that, like there was a lot of people involved, and I think you sort of touched on that a little bit more uh, sort of already. But that sounds like there was a lot of kind of plate spinning, a lot of people to kind of keep in touch with. I mean, is there sort of how does it work when you've got that many people potentially sort of getting in touch with you, and sort of are there sort of challenges with that? Yeah, I, I, it's really difficult because you, these kind of relationships are, will always be personal. Um, and when we talk about embedding, I, I, and I'm sure there will be museums that have handled this incredibly well. I still struggle to find a way to move that relationship from a relationship with, for example, me. So, you know, I think about Tonya at Volunteering Matters, like she knows me and I know her and that's a good relationship, but that relationship hasn't quite moved across I think um, so I think perhaps the way to think about it is relationships that are moving really fast right now and need a lot of nurturing and time and thought and care given to them and then relationships that are kind of ticking along and that you you know as something useful comes up you can be like hey we've got this event coming do you want to can we offer you some free tickets you know could we like I'm trying to think so like stuff with family carers like hey, should we do a fun Halloween event for just your your carers? And then one off, so it's not 
Dentist Project, which is quite involved, but we're kind of keeping things ticking over. Mm -hmm. Now, we've talked a lot about kind of external people that we might have got involved in, in this. So and whether or not it's worth having a little chat about kind of members of our own team that kind of got involved. Now, I personally, uh, as you sort of mentioned earlier, kind of joined in some of the assembly and had an absolutely lovely time. My OCD... <laughs> oh, Your paper modern. cutting was beautiful. And organising <laughs> pencils. Oh, it was just, you should have seen the sort of the stacks. They were so beautiful. I, I guess the reason why I was sort of thinking about is that I spend most of my day in front of a computer looking at spreadsheets. And now I love a spreadsheet, really do. But kind of, that's kind of quite a samey job. Now, sort of... During that very weird kind of period of time, personally, I found it absolutely marvellous to be able to step away and do something practical, do something meaningful. Um, you know, I think a lot of people will get into the museums because they feel that they are kind of a wonderful place to be and a kind of wonderful thing to kind of do and support. But if you end up then kind of doing a role where you're kind of not necessarily ever kind of seeing the kind of joy that museums bring, you're a bit disconnected. So however kind of odd the situation, stacking pencils into bags for kind of hours on end and knowing that that bag was going somewhere to someone who had really needed it, that kind of reinvigorated my love for museums. I mean, is there kind of, were there other kind of bits of feedback from some of the other people that got involved? Um, what did they think? How did they find it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I really wish I'd recorded it, but one of um, my friends who volunteered um, uh, told me that when they grew up, they had social services intervention and they were given similar things. So they were given like nice kind of craft packs and, and so on. And they said that being able to do this for children that were growing up in similar situations was really important to them. Um, and I think I really underestimated um, the production as an opportunity to support well-being of our volunteers uh, and our staff. So um, I have a severe anxiety disorder and just as lockdown hit, I'd had that one session of counselling and then lockdown hit uh, and then my therapy moved online. And I, I completely get it to be able in all that chaos and it felt just desolate at times to do something practical to that was just us in my garden with quite a lot of ice creams, uh, <laughs> marching up and down my lawn, filling activity packs, cutting paper, stacking pencils, and knowing at the end of the day, we'd filled some boxes with, I don't know what we got quite good. We were doing about 200 bags a day at one point uh, that were all going to go to individuals who were having a pretty crappy time, to be honest was really amazing and to be able to share that feedback so um uh someone at uh the women's refuge we were sending packs to said that they were when they were pre preparing the rooms for new arrivals um, and getting them ready they were putting the packs in so that children who were having just a horrendous time um there was a gift waiting for them and i know it's only small but it feels like that really to make something a bit a bit less packed Mm. I, think, I think to me at that time felt really um, precious because our community um, made, gave me something to hold on to when days felt really dark. Yeah, yeah I agree. There's something in there and we need to think about how we take that learning because we talk about it being good for volunteers. You know, we know volunteering is good for people's well-being. But I don't think we talk about that enough for staff, about how providing opportunities for staff doing all different kinds of jobs to do this really um community focused work yeah i agree i think that we need to to think about that some more having something and almost something that sort of reminds us and say why we do this job in the first place and then say i think prior to getting involved in this project i think where we work is kind of standard for us to all get involved on a kind of christmas event that we run because like thousands of people appear at once and it's all kind of hands on deck but that's sort of and that's wonderful you know that day fills everyone with joy and as I say so if we can potentially kind of create more opportunities like that I think it'd be marvelous. now we sort of touched on it right at the end of the presentation and we're sort of coming to the end of our chat now but so I suppose the sort of the natural ending point is to think about okay what what would we do next kind of what we do differently and how are we going to kind of build on this in the future 
So I guess in terms of what we could do differently, if the evaluation, so we are both self-confessed evaluation nerds. Love it. You know, we have lovely conversations about it. Um, and I just could not think of a way to effectively evaluate this project. And I also didn't want to burden families who, to be honest, had enough on. You know, the, they, they didn't need a form in, with that evaluation pack. They just needed a present from us. And it felt almost slightly demanding that we would kind of send them something to be like, now tell us we're important. You know, like, now rate, rate us on this Likert scale that we've included for your interest, for our interest, really. Um, so I did think about other ways of doing it. I thought about including a postcard where we would ask people to design something so that it was creative. Mm -hmm. Just one or two really simple questions like, what would you like in your life? You know, something, something like that. But we were doing these on such a tight budget um, that the, I don't know, let's call it 60p for a postcard and, and a stamp uh, if I'm bulk buying postcards. Mm -hmm. That would have meant about that would have been about a fifth of our budget for that pack and I just couldn't justify it if you know if that meant they didn't get colouring pencils and sellotape to get it we needed to make sure that the families got the absolute best we could give them at that time. And I also think now that I would have maybe done like now QR codes are a thing maybe in the further kind of on packs I would have included a QR code so there are you know there are there would have been ways to do it um but I'm still I don't know, I felt weird about making that demand of people. Um, but I think my overwhelming feeling about what's next is, why weren't we always doing this? Like, I, really early on, I was like, why have I not put big boxes of nice things from the museum and other arts organisations in the Women's Refuge before? That's such an, and why aren't we, we talk about going to where our community is, but we always feel like we maybe need to be there. Actually, maybe that first invitation needs to be really generous and and can just be that here is some really lovely stuff here's some activities you could do inspired by our collections here's some dance activities uh, and i i would like us as we start to reopen to step that up in terms of creating a pathway in so it's like you know what we're gonna to advertise events in that way i think for me would be a really great thing to do it's like here's your activity pack it's all about i don't know our natural history collections and here's an invitation just for you to come for free at big event they were doing. And we would so love to see you there. And maybe that event day doesn't need to be at the museum. Maybe that could be at the job centre, at the YMCA. So I think there is scope to build on this. And we are quietly, so I'm sending some packs that we have to the job centre because they're still seeing the very vulnerable families. Um, but I do think there's, as we look at what we could do in the future, I kind of want to think about these packs. Um, as a, as a tool for that, and maybe what other resources we could offer. So um, I spoke to the YMCA and a couple of residential um, uh, houses for um, young care leavers about like, do we need to leave a library of activities there? So they don't need individual packs, but just, you know, a big box that we drop off mm -hmm. inspired by the collections and the, the opportunities in Ipswich and really um, invite invite people in and I, I think the other other thing that I really hope that we take with us is that the rules as we imagine them and our project planning as we imagine it is just that it's just how we have imagined it so far and that we can break all of those rules when it means that we can better serve our community and if those rules prevent us from being of use and relevant and fun and curiosity provoking to our community well then those rules are no good and we need to think again nice uh, <laughs> one of the one of the things that i would probably end with was that sort of when we were um getting in touch with museums and heritage about doing this and we were kind of umming and ahhing as curators and museum staff do about the titles and what we might call it yeah one of the, the other ideas was how kind of something kind of amazing and something actually quite big and impactful can come out of something quite small and it might seem that this kind of in, a, in the beginning we kind of imagine this to be kind of a fairly small modest project but we know from the conversations that we've had and the sort of feedback that we've received how much it meant to people and it's that kind of significant wonderful impact that I think you know we are both immensely proud of and that we hope that we can kind of learn from and build on sort of inspire future kind of changes in what we do um so hopefully everyone out there has found this kind of a little bit interesting maybe a little bit inspirational and maybe kind of 
if you, there's something that you can do, go back and kind of see some rules that you can maybe not tear up, but maybe. Maybe it's more conservative than me. Tear up the rules. It'll be really fun. Let's see what happens. <laughs> so, yeah. If there's something that maybe is a red tape that kind of you think is there, but maybe we kind of could get around in a different way when we have to. I think hopefully that's the, the main takeaway we'd like to kind of share with you guys. So thank you very much for watching. Um, if you want to contact Ellie or I, please do. Ellie's email address at the start, I think you put in, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, it's so, eleanor.root at colchester.gov.uk, but you can also find me on Twitter at eleanor underscore root. And mine is elizabeth.fox at colchester.gov.uk, also on Twitter, so I am at liblufox. Um, hope to hear from you, and if you have any questions, please just hit us up on Twitter or email. Thanks so much. Bye.